so we've got a really good uh, panel here. I'm going to do the super quick introductions, then we're going to go down the line and everyone's going to talk about what they do. Um, so we'll just start at this end. Um, Jay Gorin, VP of BizDev at Quixi. Um, Dan Levine, uh, Platform BD at Dropbox. Uh, Christina Cordova, BD at Stripe, uh, and previously Pulse. Maxim Gaffey, I know I'm not doing your name right, but it's good enough. Close enough, COO of AirPair and previously being here at Pivotal. And then uh, Bob CEO of SocialWire, previously Dig and AOL BD. Got it, everyone? All right, that'd be good. So what I'd like to start off with um, is, is kind of a softball question, but I think it's be pretty interesting. We have a very diverse group of BD folks on this panel, from platform to strategic partnerships to everything in between. So I'd love to actually go down the line, maybe starting with you, Dick, and actually just describe what you do. Describe a little day in the life of what you do, and, and on the bigger picture view, you know, tactically what do you do, and the bigger picture, like, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve as a, a VP of this town? It's an excellent question I ask you all the time. <laughs> um, so I oversee BD for Quixi, which means a lot of things at Quixi. Quixi is a business to business company in many ways. We license app search technology to search engines, manufacturers, and carriers. And a life in the BD there is a little complicated. We have our distribution partnerships, where we're actually licensing our te technology out, which is very much almost a sales-like role. We have our inbound partnerships, where we're licensing data into the company. And then we have our general strategic relationships with both developers and other things. Um, and then finally, we have what we consider Quixi are the very special business deals. Everything from setting up public Wi-Fi networks to negotiating new really big contracts for things. Uh, all of that falls under BD at Quixi. And that kind of encompasses a 20-hour day for all of us at the BD team. And, and your major strategic goals are just to continue all the... So our the major strategic goals is the distribution. Distribution is our primary goal of the BD team. It just evolved as a reality that if you've got the best negotiators, the best business people in this one team in the company, it tended to be they just kind of threw on more business role because, well, they got it done back. Cool. Dan. Well, I'm Dan. Um, I work on kind of platform partnerships with Dropbox. Uh, so hopefully a lot of you guys know Dropbox. Uh, thanks. Uh, no part to me. But um, Dropbox is basically hopefully the best place for all of your stuff that we make it available on whatever device or operating system you're on. Uh, the reason this is important is kind of the job of, of platform partnerships is to make sure that data is also available in your favorite applications. Right? If you're in Kind of mail application or CRM tool, you should be able to access that Dropbox data super seamlessly. And it shouldn't matter if you're on mobile web, because we can get it to you. It shouldn't matter if you're on iOS, you want to attach a file, we can make that work for you, um, no matter where kind of your data came from. So that's kind of the goal of Platform Partners strategically. Uh, and it's really around user growth, uh, engagement uh, with your content, and then you know, long term, we think that engagement will lead to, to monetization. Uh, and what's the day in the life? Well, Kind of the fun thing about platform partnerships is it takes advantage of kind of like a, a relatively simple concept and then you expand from there. So partnerships have all kinds of different uh, aspects to them. Um, you know, there's legal, it's business development, there's uh, marketing, sales, and actually a product creation. Uh, and one of the core beliefs that I have and Dropbox has is we're a pretty good product organization. Um, and we want to make sure that we can get that product everywhere. So we have this great thing, it's an API, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with APIs. And basically what the API does is it just plummets the cost of doing product integration with partners. Right? So all of a sudden, all these deals that would take um, too much other costs, whether it's legal or marketing, now suddenly become feasible because trying to figure out how to do that product integration, you don't have to get our engineers or fire anything custom. Uh, and so that's kind of what drives my day to day. Is, okay, there's all these new opportunities where we don't have to do custom work, we can just work with the API. So that frees me up to uh, pursue a bunch of more stuff. Hi, um, I'm Christina, and um, I work at Stripe. Uh, if you don't know what Stripe is, uh, we make it really easy for businesses to process payments online. Um, and I guess to give you some background as to what I do, uh, generally I would say I kind of work in two different areas. Um, one is to extend the growth of our platform by uh, making sure that if a platform exists out there that works with businesses in any way, uh, that Stripe is integrated into that platform. So uh, e-commerce platforms, invoicing platforms, anything that touches payments in any way, uh, we like to work with those platforms uh, so that they integrate um, our API 
and then can begin driving users directly to Stripe. So those partners are core to our overall uh, distribution of our product. And then I also work with partners that build interesting applications on top of our APIs. So there are a lot of partners that can build tools um, and products that make Stripe's product better as a result or um, allow us to not have to build that product because somebody else is building it on top of our platform instead. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, kind of our goals generally, I mean, our, our goals are to really grow uh, the number of users signing up for Stripe, so businesses that, that use Stripe through these other uh, partnerships, and, um, you know, by virtue of that, growing revenue uh, that uh, passes through the Stripe platform. And in terms of day-to-day, um, I'd say I work mostly externally. Um, often I'm just working with partners and potential partners, but um, often I'm also working internally with our product teams um, and with our legal teams, probably most closely, um, because often they're building the APIs and products that our partners use, and then you know our legal teams help us get uh, the deals done. So. Awesome. Good. Are you so these two gentlemen, COO of uh, Bear Repair and CEO of Social Wire, but you've come up through the BizDev world. So kind of talk about what you're doing in your respective roles and how BizDev is influenced. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Maxim. I'm the co-founder and CEO of AirPair. Uh, for those of you guys who are not familiar with AirPair, we're uh, a network of technical experts uh, that help software teams build better software and build it faster. Uh, check us out at AirPair.com. Um, so, uh, uh, Nathan actually doesn't have my background quite right in that uh, I have a technical background and uh, I worked as an engineer for a few years and then transitioned over to the uh, business side and done everything from sales to uh, running other startups, uh, CLing, uh, partnerships with big companies and small companies and wasting a lot of effort and money on partnerships that haven't worked out. Um, so, um, and now, uh, actually, I'm going to guess that AirPair here is, uh, is the smallest uh, company you represented on the panel, um, which uh, I'm pretty excited to uh, share with everyone. Um, my experience is uh, doing business development as a tiny, no game startup and trying to bust down doors and uh, get some recognition and trying to get some uh, calls and emails answered. Uh, but in general, in terms of my role, you know, we're, we're a four-person team. Um, we, uh, we tend to do a bit of everything, um, so that includes business development, includes sales, includes um, hiring, running products, um, software development, so. Hi, glad to be here. Uh, Bob Book. Um, I was already outed by Van Horn as the Jew with curly hair, so you'll recognize me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm a CEO of Social Wire. Um, we, we are a, a recommendation engine for ads um, focused on social networks. Um, you know, I think I'm going to try to take a little bit of a contrarian position on this panel tonight in terms of BD. Um, I've done a lot of BD. I, was, I ran BD at Dig for you know, three and a half years. Um, and, uh, until Matt took it over and then took credit for all of my work. <laughs> um, no, Matt, Matt deserves a lot of credit. Um, and uh, and then I, I did BD at AOL, got to do the sort of big company BD thing, and then um, and then I joined SocialWire actually as chief revenue officer because I decided I was I was done with BD and I wanted to do um, and, and I can explain why I felt like BD was not no longer the right career path for me. And um, so I really wanted to get into sales. And I did that for about six months and then um, ended up taking over the role of CEO, which it was obviously I mean, something I ultimately wanted to do. And so it was a great opportunity for me. And, um, and so I've been doing that for the last nine months or so. And um, my day to day, now is actually I, I also do sales. I didn't get to give someone else the sales job, um, and I love it. And the reason I love doing sales is because you know exactly what success looks like. You know, you sell somebody a product that they want, and they give you money, which is what your company wants, and then you go back, and everyone on your team high fives you, and it's like 
you know, sometimes you fail, sometimes you succeed, but you know. And um, it's very measurable and um, very satisfying in that way. So that's one of my favorite parts about the job. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good. All right. So now we know what it does. Uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit, uh, a little bit more on how a BE person is measured, or how you know your job is measured. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's start off with a little bit on timing. And Max, we had a few interesting comments in our in our prep on on timing. Is it ever too early to start? You know, layering on BD at a startup. You had some some about horror stories or some challenges at your last startup uh, doing some business. Why don't you give us a, a little bit? And Sure. Um, so when uh, you know, I love uh, like following the blogosphere and like reading people's musings on startups and uh, sales, like doing sales and business development at startups and like focused on all this stuff. Um, and uh, like a lot of a lot of folks uh, make or give this advice of uh, be careful when doing business development because um, you can really set yourself up for this new failure by approaching the wrong partners or approaching um, the right partners but at the wrong time, approaching it too early. Um, so I think it's, it's something that um, I was telling Nathan that I went to the school of hard knocks um, on, um, at a previous company called uh, Digit Media, Digit.com. Um, we, uh, we were a known company and we were trying to get our name out there. We were trying to uh, become a legit legitimate player in the television ecosystem, and it's like pretty hard to break into that and get people to uh, pay attention to you. So, um, business development was a part of that strategy, and uh, I mercilessly pursued a partnership with Motorola, which is a much bigger company. And um, after much uh, blood, sweat, and tears, um, we ended up being preloaded on all the Motorola tablets and actively promoted by Motorola. Um, which sounds pretty awesome. And we actually like, executed on the plan and kind of got to where we wanted to get to. Um, the flip side of like all that effort, and this is where uh, my learnings are captured in terms of like going, going to the school of hard knocks. Um, dealing with a company like Motorola was uh, a, like a monumental effort. And it's just such a huge bureaucracy. You can get stuck. Uh, in their process, and as a small, like as you know, this, this is really uh, most applicable, most applicable to small startups. For a small company, um, the, the amount of resources that you have is very limited, and you have to be very judicious uh, in terms of how you utilize the resources. So every single like, hour that one of your engineers spends trying to inter integrate uh, into a partner's product, you know, every single hour that you spend as an operator, uh, like thinking about this, is like. Time taken away from doing something else. No, and so I think uh, if I were to summarize my very long-winded answer to this, I would say you have to think very deeply about what is actually strategic and what is not strategic. Um, like, is this a model like of a partnership that you're thinking about that you you think will like scale and uh, uh, transform, but have transformative effects on the business? Uh, or is it something that you're doing just for PR and uh, you know, uh, like other secondary effects? I guess that I would say that that's my biggest uh, takeaway. Sure. Uh, Christina or, or anyone else? When did when did Stripe bring on? Were you the first BD person, or did they? Yeah, yes, yes, the first full time person um, on BD, but um, other folks at Stripe uh, focused on BD. So when when did Stripe bring you on, or bring you on, you know, bring um, the team in? About a year and three months ago, and we were 28 people at the time. Okay. Um, and when I started, our COO had done um, a few deals um, that were essentially you know, the first of its kind, and then they were realizing, oh, this is a really good idea. Maybe we should do more of these, and maybe we should do deals in other verticals and other areas. And so when I came in, um, I kind of figured out, um, you know, okay, let's figure out what the market is, who are the potential partners that we can work with. Uh, what value could be added to their platform and what value could um, you know, they bring to us in return. So. Cool. Okay. Either. Gents, want to talk about the timing of BD role at the startup? I was the fifth hire at Quincy. Uh, our CEO felt very, it was very critical that if he was going to be CEO, he couldn't be touching the customers every day because he would get biased by that influence. And more importantly, he didn't want to distract, distract the company. 
what he was up to and what the whole company was up to by engaging with customers. We knew that in our early stages, there was no point in trying to do a deal. But it was critical to start those conversations to get to know who we were going to want to do a deal with, who were going to be our first four or five customers, what were they actually looking for, what were the things we were going to need to have ready by the time we got there. Um, it was critical to a lot of our early fundraising because we were able to have validation from big partners who would say, yeah, we know those Quixie guys, they're doing interesting stuff. We didn't have any deals yet, but we were able to show validation in the marketplace even without those first deals because people knew who we were and what we were up to and they were impressed. Um, our BD team is pretty large now. It's probably about eight, which I consider enormous for a company of our size. Um, we do a lot of stuff, but I think it's super, I'm biased, I'm in BD obviously, I guess most of you guys are as well, but I think it can be extremely beneficial to a small company to have someone literally on the pulse of what's going on out there, what are our competitors doing, what are our potential partners doing, without having to invest the CEO's time, who's probably either trying to raise money or build product, or your COO's time, or your chief product guy's time. Those are all critical people that need to be building what's right for itself. At the same time, it's sometimes nice to have that struggle early on where your CEO can look at the things you're bringing back from the customer and what the engineers are saying and say, you know what, we're going to do A and B, but C, C's a bad idea. And our partners are asking for it, but I'm telling you in a year, they're not going to want it and we're going to be ready in a year. So ignore that feedback, don't worry, just keep placating them. I think it's extremely important. It was a, it was a big part of our company getting started and it's committed to a lot of our success that have been so focused on understanding what the market's looking for, what we want to build, and how do we bridge those gaps strategically. Yeah, I think that. Um, not really. I mean, I, I'm somewhat of a reluctant BD guy. I feel the people on this panel uh, come from more of a technical background. This is actually my first BD role, I guess, officially. Um, and I think right now, technically, I'm the longest tenured BD person in Dropbox, which is terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just both, both poorly close. No, um, I think BD at Dropbox, has been extremely successful, um, but I think kind of the most important thing is understanding what you're doing. You made a great comment. Uh, you know, you want to know what kind of a company you are, and I think a lot of us here today are probably here because we're product and technical companies at our core. Uh, and so what you want to do is leverage that core competency, right? So if Dropbox didn't have a great product, then it wouldn't be able to kind of leverage that for successful BD. That said, Dropbox is first the true BD people probably started in the early 30s, maybe late 20s. Um, a guy named Lars, who's unbelievable. Uh, and probably the most notable fruit of our BD team because I, I truly believe in having not worked on it, it's, the, it's probably the best BD deal in kind of the history of Silicon Valley, or pretty damn close, um, is our Samsung deal. Uh, and if you can get a deal like that, I, I should describe it. So we're, we're kind of part of the onboarding experience for every Samsung Galaxy device sold uh, in the world pending kind of the carrier approval uh, on the end side. That's been extremely successful for us. Um, so you set up your phone number, you set up your Google Apps, your Android, and then you set up Dropbox. Um, those are the steps to the Samsung device. And I don't think any of us could have predicted how successful Samsung would be. Uh, at the time we did that deal, they were not the top OEM. Um, so it worked phenomenally well for us. Not only the top OEM, they're truly massive. So it works, but you really want to have a great core to leverage, and you want to make sure it's not a huge distraction. Even for a player as large as Samsung, um, we always remember that our core focus is kind of on making our product great, uh, and then we're not really doing that. Yeah, interesting. Let's let's talk about a few, um, uh, you know, process <coughs> details on that. Like that deal, obviously a huge company making deal. Uh, how long did it take? When did Lars, you know, start on start working on that? And how long did it take? And, and Jake, with you two, and, and, and everyone on the panel, I know uh, Quixie has some really interesting deals with Microsoft and Nokia. You know, what's the? Give us a peek inside the process timing and sort of like uh, how you keep it all moving. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you two stories, one from when we were much smaller and there was only two people on the BD team, myself and a recent college graduate who was willing to work for $2,000 a month. You may know him, he get, makes a lot more now. Um, in the early days, it was a lot of fake it till you make it. So you spend a lot of time going to meetings, listening to them, talking, getting their information, pretending that you're going to go talk to your engineers but just desperately trying to figure it out on your own. Um, and then submitting, walking through the process. Big companies have big process. And it's important that you respect the fact they're going to have process. You can't get frustrated when a company of 50,000 says it's going to take three months to get through their evaluation stage. It's just the reality. And I think it's important as a small company, you communicate that to your investors and be real about that. Your investors will appreciate the fact that you know it's going to take time and that you know you're not going to just knock a deal out in the first six weeks. It's not going to happen. 
Um, so some of our earlier, like we have a relationship with ISC, that took a solid year to do from like first bum rushing their CEO at a conference to all the way through to actually ink on paper, and then took another six months to actually get the thing launched. Mostly our fault. But um, it got it done. Um, later stage stuff, like some of like our relationship with Microsoft, surprisingly it was a little shorter. We had better staff on our side at that point. More of the company was put together. But that still took a significant amount of time. I think key things to focus on is always be listening to what, not just what their company is, but what does that team need? I think one of the big things that we sometimes forget is that everyone's a person, right? Everyone you're talking to is a person at the other company. And they've got their individual goals for you. How are they evaluated? Are they evaluated on getting deals done? Are they evaluated on how many installs, downloads, dollars they made? Whatever that metric is, does your deal ref reflect what's going to make them look good? What's going to make their boss look good? How are you framing your conversations? That's going to drive things much faster. If you're not paying attention to what that individual who's actually on the phone with you, who's probably a manager or a director, you're not, you know, VPs rarely do deals. CEOs never do deals. Meeting with the CEO of a company is nice, and it may or may not get you anywhere. But a, a manager who wants to be VP is going to work a lot harder to make sure that deal comes off as a success and makes them look good. So you've got to find those partners who are going to be hungry um, and focus in on the needs. Really listen in the conversations. It's not just about what you're selling to them, because that's what your head's full of. It's what do they need to get done and how do you fit into that story. I think that was critical for all the deals we've done. Um, but just, you've got to be, if you're looking to do a deal with a big company, be prepared to spend a long time. And one thing we learned was do a few small ones while you're at it. Nothing is better. We did a launch in Singapore. It was actually our first partner, who was like a major carrier, who wasn't very, who wasn't major really, but so Star Hub, fantastic partner. We came in saying we've never done this before. And they said, we know. <laughs> we said, there's gonna be problems. They said, we expect them. But give us a chance, and we gave them a chance. And we learned so much from that deal. We had so many things go wrong in the integration, in the preload, in the this, and the that. And then later when we came into Sprint, we had none of those things go wrong. So I can't stress enough, it's worthwhile to go do one or two deals that no, you know, Starhub was never gonna make our company. But they've been a great partner to date. They take all of our brand new tech, even when it doesn't work all so well. And it lets us learn in a market that we can really learn from. You know, Singapore which speaks English. Everyone's got two cell phones. It's a fantastic market. Can't encourage you enough. Try it out. Um, learn without screwing up for the big boys. Because I can tell you, there's not a lot of forgiveness at that the big boy level. There just isn't. When, uh, yeah, you talk about Microsoft deals. When I was at Dig, I'd been there for about two weeks. And, um, the, uh, basically the um, guy that was running all the business stuff at that point just handed me, you know, he, he was actually going on vacation for a week and he just handed me their, our off-the-shelf Google AdSense deal and said, hey, get us a better deal. Um, you know, Microsoft and Yahoo are interested in repping our ad inventory. So, um, I, I think one of the things I learned as, you know, I was the guy that came in to run BD, but, um, you know, there were a lot of people that could have done that deal and, you know, entrusting it to a two-week, someone who had been there for two weeks was not necessarily, I think, the plan that, uh, that that guy had had, but, um, you know, when you get a deal like that, take it, own it, and make it really clear to everybody in the company that you own the deal, and, um, you know, so for me, that was sort of how I established my credibility at Dig. I, I did that deal. It actually didn't take that. It, it was maybe six weeks. Uh, one of the things we did to get the deal done quickly is we had Microsoft come down. We had all the stakeholders, and we had a, you know, no one gets out of here alive meeting where we just locked ourselves in a conference room and just we negotiated. And then when we needed to step out and talk amongst ourselves, we did that. And, um, we spent all day and we hammered out, you know, 80, 90 percent of the deal, and then the last 10 percent took five weeks. But it was um, it was a massive deal for Dig, and it gave me ownership over basically all of our everything that Dig did with with ads after that. And um, I think it was it was it was really good for um, you know for my career to to really own that. I think what I learned more than anything was not in the closing of that deal, but in the sort of the subsequent renegotiation a year later when management changed at Microsoft. They had acquired this new company. The people at Quanta were now in charge and um, and basically they, you know, they started playing the big company, you know, David and Goliath thing 
with us and started, um, you know, it, it, they made life very difficult for us. And it, it became a situation that was untenable for Dig, and we, we needed a way out of it. And we were really feeling a lot of pain. And one of the things um, I realized was going to be key to figuring this out was building a relationship with these new guys. And, um, you know, because the guys that we did a deal with, you know, they didn't, they had a vested interest in us being happy. And these new guys had absolutely, I mean, they just didn't care. It was all numbers to them. So I remember very distinctly thinking there was one, there was a conference, an IAB conference out in Florida. And I was thinking, should I go to this thing? You know, it's a lot of money. I don't know. I remember asking, you know, my boss, hey, do you think I should go? And when you ask it like that, the answer is always, eh, we probably don't need to. And I remember sleeping on it. And I came the next day and I said, you know what, dude, I'm going. And I bought a ticket. I flew out there. I had nothing to do with that conference other than just actually meet these guys in person. And I didn't even have a meeting with them yet. And I, I managed to, to get a meeting with the, you know, the head BD guy there and ended up having dinner with him. And we had a couple glasses of wine. And he was a great guy. And it was just a matter of, and there was nothing cheesy about what I was doing. I was just like, talking to the guy and, you know, building a relationship over wine. And then he told me that um, he suggested that Dig should threaten to sue Microsoft over this deal. Because he was like, yeah, we're kind of screwing you guys over, and Microsoft listens to lawyers. And he was like, in fact, I'm suing Microsoft right now over you know, my company got acquired. And, um, <laughs> so, you know, it's just like I walked away from nothing. Oh my God, I'm so glad I came to this thing. And it's like, you know, part of this job is really about relationships. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't, we wouldn't expect a, a BD hack to be to to make something, but uh, you know, we did get some to move. But uh, that's that's good. You know, maybe Ruby. Uh, All right. Just going to add something um, to what to what you said about. Um, Respecting the big company's process, uh, that's very true. Uh, what I would add to that is um, it, would, uh, it benefits you a lot if you, if you have your own process in place. So if you're, if you're pursuing like, a certain kind of, a, a certain kind of a, an idea or a partnership, and maybe that idea like, came to you and had a conversation with a specific potential partner, um, like, that partnership isn't restricted to that, to that, like, to that one company. Right? So, like, uh, what really helps to move things along is to cast a much wider net in mind. Like, just start pursuing anyone who could be potentially like who could, could, who could potentially qualify for the kind of deal that you envision. And that, um, especially for a small company, like you're always looking for leverage and you're always like trying to figure out how to get these like big behemoths to like move a little faster. Uh, so when you have you know when you have something interesting to offer um, and you, you create a process where you're managing a pipeline potential potential partners. Um, you know, you can kind of play that off to your advantage and you can just say, yeah, look, we realistically we have, you know, only enough resources to move first with just one partner, like we just, you know, we're a small company, so we're looking for our first partner. Uh, so those kinds of conversations are like really helpful when you're thinking about how to like grease the wheels a little bit and get things to move a little faster. Yeah, Christina, Dan, do you guys have any, any comments on process or, or increasing leverage? Increasing the, the process, do you at, at Stripe have a fairly well defined process when you're doing deals with um, you know, e commerce platforms? Yeah, I think our, our process is pretty well defined. Um, you know, I think there are some things that you, you come in and, and you understand you know, what your company is and is not willing to do. Um, you know, to give you a sense, most of our partners are doing the integrations, so we're not doing any of the integration ourselves, like, we're not touching any of our technology. If we build something, it's not just going to be for one partner. It's going to be for you know every partner eventually. So um, we don't you know build one-offs or those kinds of things. So I think you kind of have to have rules in terms of what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. But um, I, and, I, and I think that's really helpful. Um, you know, to give you an example, uh, we do not market any of our partnerships to um, any of our users directly. And the second you start doing that, if you you know email all of your users and say like, hey, look at this new integration, um, you know, all of your partners will start asking for that. And then you're going to be committed to doing that. 
um, going forward. So I think you just need to be very careful and just say, you know, here's the process for how we do things, um, you know, and have a good reason for, you know, why you don't do certain things. Um, I, I think in terms of just relationship building, making sure that um, you're in a good place, um, you know, I think at Stripe I've been very lucky, uh, a lot of our partners love working with us. Um, at my last role, I, I would say that wasn't always the case. Um, and that's because, um, you know, I worked at a company called Pulse, we uh, made a news reading application uh, that surfaced content from um, you know, news outlets, content providers. And, um, you know, one of, in our very early days, we were just three people and we were uh, sued by the New York Times. Um, and um, other companies, uh, you know, threatened to sue us as well. Um, you know, and eventually I needed to turn these relationships around um, and <laughs> get them into a really good place. Um, and, and so it, it's kind of hard uh, when you're coming in and, you know, there's just um, really bad blood there and you need to work with that partner, get them to a place where they understand exactly what you're trying to do. Um, you know, but often, uh, you know, we weren't necessarily the type of company that would, um, you know, listen to everything um, and, you know, um, implement everything in the way that they wanted us to do it. So I think you still kind of have to hold your ground, um, you know, but making sure that you kind of have uh, the back to do that. Interesting. Um, maybe continue on the, the scaling BD a little bit. Um, Dan, you mentioned in our prep about partnerships and flywheel effects, which I thought was kind of a fun comment. To you. Aligning partnerships into a workflow cycle, right? So you can replicate something that becomes bigger than any individual deal. Want to elaborate on that and maybe give an example? Sure. Um, and just like a, a little quick note on the last question, but super yeah, yeah. quick, I promise. Um, you know, my role at Drop, I spent a lot of time interfacing with our product and edge teams and our partnership team. Uh, so a lot of our processes, if you want to say no to somebody, you pass it to me. I tell them why we can't do it. Um, the other thing about process that, that's tricky, and I, I would I would caution, is you know we talk to a lot of very very large players, um, especially in like the OEM and carrier space, and they all have a process. Yeah, the moment on a custom negotiation somebody tells me they have a process and they won't do something, is pretty much the moment I stop talking. To them. Um, I think the whole point of a custom negotiation is that we're bending. So if your process is you don't commit to a minimum number of units moved. My process is probably won't work with you, or I'll make you pay some crazy fee for something else. So I think that's something you can do when you're a little bit bigger company, and thank God Dropbox has done well, otherwise I'd just be an asshole. But um, <laughs> in the meantime, it's worked nice. So on, on how the flywheel effects, I think like fundamentally with partnerships, and I, I kind of reduce things to, to try in simple terms, when, when you're working with one partner, maybe it's a group, let's just say one other partner, you're trying to find like a great optimal solution. And there's this like area under the curve that works for both parties, right? There, there's like some multitude of points at which everyone wins. And what you want to do in your partnership talk is hopefully you're in that great optimal without, without bullshitting and faking it. Um, and that's great. And then you kind of want to move toward the edge that's most favorable to you in that great optimal set, right? And this is like a really boring way of putting it. But so what are the things that are, you know, you can move uh, towards that kind of perimeter to make yourself more advantageous? And the obvious one is asymmetric. Um, kind of uses, right? Um, and so one big asymmetric use case is kind of these flywheel effects, right? So when you do one partnership with one player in space, uh, you know, in our interest, we work with Samsung, actually we work with HTC and then crack Samsung. Um, after that, you have a much better chance and the cost of working with other OEM players drops precipitously, right? And when we're, when we're working with Samsung, one of the things we're working with is much smaller scale from a user footprint perspective. And all of a sudden you do a deal with Samsung and now you're talking about hundreds of millions of users uh, in, in just a couple of years. Um, and so those asymmetric effects, you know, that matters less to a company like Samsung is, you know, we're giving you guys 10 million plus users. Uh, what matters more is kind of, for their case, they wanted to have a product to deal with iCloud and the iPhone, and they didn't want to be so reliant on Google. That's their asymmetry. You know, I, I can mostly care less about that, right? I mean, that's not so interesting to me, but it's extremely important to them, regardless of their size. And we can solve that problem. For us, what we wanted was, kind of scale and to get to this next level so we can deal with more um, kind of OEMs, manufacturers, and people like carriers and other large software companies. And so you want to always keep an eye out towards like what else am I getting from the partnership that kind of helps me do more of these deals. Um, you know, if I'm building some kind of an engineering or product integration, can I repurpose this? If I'm doing some kind of legal framework, can I create a system that I can have other people deal with, right? It's really easy for us to say, well, like if you can ship us on hundreds of millions of devices, then we'll make a deal like that. Samsung. And sure enough, there's you know two companies in the world that can do that. So you know the, 
the number of people who can respond back with anything are pretty low. Uh, so always keep in mind like what else you're getting from this partnership. And it's not just where you're negotiating right across the table with that person. Right? It's not just that phone call or that one deal. It's often like I can leverage this toward other people. Uh, so often working with like the second largest player in the market is really important because it puts competitive pressure on the first player, but also all the other people in that market. And then you become kind of a de facto standard, right? And everyone suddenly has to have uh, your integration and your, your deal to make themselves viable. I've got ideas. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Uh, there's a great process hack. Uh, a woman by the name of Ellen Barnes and Sam Lelouch, who are early product people at Quixi, who aren't with us anymore, but they, we were doing our first deals and they said, we've got to have a process. I'm like, we're infinitesimally small, we have to follow the process. I'm like, no, Jake, you got to do this. So I remember we cooked up this, this phony process slide, and it was phony <laughs> because it wasn't really, it was baked up between us over beer. And I took it to it in the next big partner meeting. And one of our biggest issues, when especially when we were early, was you have big companies that will dangle carrots in front of you and never actually close the deal. So we created a process, and I said, this is what's going to happen. When we do deals, this is our process. And this is how we follow it. At this point, we start the contract track negotiation. And at this point, we do this, and then we, you know, we do an integration here, and then a contract here. We do this here, and then that there. And they all bought into this, oh, they like, you know, big companies like process. And it was able to start driving the conversations where, okay, we've talked about this, do you acknowledge we've gotten this part done, you've done the evaluation? Yeah, evaluation's done great. So we're going to start the contract negotiation now before we do the next step. We're not close it, but we're going to start it. And then we're going to get this next piece done. And it helped us start getting our partners to really either put up or shut up faster. And that actually helped scale our flywheel, which would allow us, oh my, my gosh, now we've got, you know, we'd all back up into our Salesforce staging. If you're not using Salesforce as a BD person, you're not really doing sales, but damn it, you need process. And I would strongly recommend getting it, setting it up appropriately for your needs and working through it. But it started getting people into this process of like, okay, if you're gonna to come to the table and start talking about contract or show us your contract, or well, they're not really serious yet. So they obviously haven't really finished their evaluation. So it's really, nothing is better than having a fake process on a slide somewhere where you can tell someone, this is the process we're gonna go through, and we're right here right now. And getting them to acknowledge as they've gone through the different steps, and now we're at this part of the process. And they go, yes we are, and you go, excellent. <laughs> because they love process. They do, they're big companies, they have process, they're all about them, they're used to seeing them. So as a startup, if you have one, A, they assume you're bigger than you are. And I would strongly recommend you portray yourself as bigger than you are. Um, just do it. I can't express that, it's important. If you tell someone you're a five-person startup, you won't even be able to get a 10-person startup to talk to you. <laughs> but if you tell them that we're, we're a growing team, okay, sure. Um, but definitely have your own process. Even if you haven't gotten all the way through one yet, this is how it's going to work out or we want it to work out. You can always tweak, you can always modify, but it sets the stage that this is what we're going to do when, and your partners, will, especially the bigger companies, will really respond well to that. Sorry, I had to add that hack. It was great. Yeah, great. Thanks to Sam Williams for giving that to me. It's been fantastic ever since. I love it. Anyone else got a hack? I mean, I think this is always a concern when you're a startup doing a deal with a larger entity is that you get stuck in the mud like you did with Gidget and Motorola, right? And you kind of ended down resources and sucks up time and everything else. So I mean, it's always a challenge. How do you break out of that? And I think having a fake process is a great way to do that. Any other process hacks or? Uh, um, I've got a pretty, pretty interesting uh, hack. I guess sort of like a story to tell. Um, when I was starting Digit, um, this company was barely anything more than just an idea in my head. And in order for like me to reach to the next step, um, we had to have a certain kind of partnership in place with Apple. Um, and this, kind of, this partnership is called, um, they call it the Meet for iPod program. And it's like super dated and it, like, there's so much process around that. And they have a, a team that's like multiple tiers deep that like runs it. And it's very like opaque. It's like if, uh, if you guys um, have dealt with uh, publishing an iOS app in the App Store, uh, dealing with the MFI team at Apple, um, like takes that to like up two levels, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, so I was in my living room trying to figure out how to like get into this uh, program, and no one was really returning my calls or like you know I submitted the application and it was like stuck somewhere. Um, and I was trying to like do all the hacks that like Matt was talking about and like just thinking about but pulling out all the stops, you know, the cable. What can I do next? Like nothing's working. Like and this thing is like just stuck somewhere. I felt like I was in some kind of a Kafka like novel, you know. <laughs> Um, and so what I did, like at the, like at the end, um, what I, what I ended up doing was um, I read through the NDA that I had to sign with Apple to even get into like this education process. And in the NDA, 
I saw like who countersigned the contract, and I was like, oh, interesting. So then I, I did Nat's hack. Like I just called out Apple's corporate number, and I was like, hey, can you transfer me to this person? And he wasn't available, so I left a voice mail message, and I was like, you know, hey, um, I'm my company's an applicant, and kind of to your point of like making yourself yourself seem bigger than you really are. Like at that point I was just like a guy in his living room like making this whole call. But I mean, you know, a very professional sounding, I left a very professional sounding voicemail message saying like, hey, we're really excited to work with you. You know, we have some like real value to add great ideas for right now this could benefit with like both parties. Um, it seems like our application is stuck somewhere in the process. Like we'd love to get a call back and chat about this further and then he yeah, actually called me back the next day. <laughs> like, uh, he was like the guy. He was the guy at the top of that like MFI pyramid uh, that ran it. Um, and then I really explained to him like well, what I was trying to do. It really made sense. Um, and then like, I think a few days later, like we got into that, that program and got to the next to the next step. So be, to Matt's point, uh, be, uh, be audacious. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was sort of a BD hack, sort of a relationship hack. Um, had to do with Apple, of course, uh, where it's totally relationship driven. Uh, when I was at AOL, um, you know, we had I think 50 apps that we wanted a promotion for in the app store, and we had a big tablet app coming out. And um, so I just, I knew I was gonna have to somehow hack into Apple's like, you know, wall. And they're just like so walled up, it's like they won't even like look you in the eyes. And, it's like they're not allowed to have a personal relationship with people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you know, we had them come in, and it was sort of this stuffy in the office meeting. And then on the way out, I went to the guy that looked the least robotish of, of all of them, and I said, and he was a guy that ran App Store Marketing. And I said, hey, it's like, you know, for our next meeting, can we just do it out of the office, like somewhere? Like, I don't know, let's go on a hike, or like, let's just like get some exercise or something. And then he suggested golf, and I'm so perfect. You know, I suck at golf, but it's like, I would definitely hang out with you for five hours. And, uh, <laughs> and so we got him, um, I actually got a golf game set up um, for him and his boss. And so I was really excited to even get like, his boss there. And then his boss bailed maybe like a week before the game. And he was like, so you know, you still want to go? Like, definitely, I'll find somebody. And unfortunately, actually, the guy that Nathan and I both know, this guy that worked for me, had recently sat next to this famous football player, Ronnie Lott, on a flight from Southwest. Um, Southwest, and I just chatted him up and got to know him. You know, Ronnie Lott has four Super Bowl rings, played for the Niners, um, and so he had gotten. Ronnie Lott's email address, because they just talked about technology, Ronnie Lott wanted to do some investing and stuff. And so I was like, hey, Bill, we need one more person for this foursome. I know Ronnie Lott plays golf, like, you got to get him to come play golf with us at Apple. Tell him, like, you know, it's, you know, he wants to get into technology. And, and it turned out, this guy from Apple was like, Ronnie Lott was his hero and his dad's hero. And so four of us played golf together. On the third hole, Ronnie Lop was like, you know, showing me how to swing a club. <laughs> For me, but then in the end, this guy from Apple ended up winning $10 off of Ronnie Lott. Ronnie Lott had signed his $10 bill for him. So after that, after I got back, I sent an email to Tim Armstrong and I said, I think we're pretty much guaranteed distribution of our iPad app in the App Store. <laughs> and, and we did actually get the, the feature, so. I love it. I, and maybe, just hearing you for just a second, because when we last left off here, we'll talk there, you were getting sued by Microsoft at Pulse. You're at Pulse, getting sued by Microsoft. Times. Oh, New York Times, right. Um, nice. And, uh, <laughs> but then I was looking at your bio, and on the bio it says, you know, at Pulse Post, partnerships with 340 media organizations. So clearly you went from getting sued by New York Times to, to closing a bunch of these. Any interesting anecdotes of bringing in Super Bowl champions to help smooth that deal? Um, so I think this was kind of mentioned earlier, but um, I think talking about you know kind of which players are working on the space and um, you know essentially uh, the relationship with the uh, really large publisher at the time. So uh, the York Times, Wall Street Journal. Um, Etc. Um, you know, we're not in a very good place uh, when I started, and so uh, we started um, really by working with uh, tech publications. 
So um, at the time, um, really like a lot of the editors and the people that wrote about Pulse and the app, uh, I was just saying like, hey, uh, can we use your content? And this is like a tech rant when you were at AOL. Um, I was like, hey, so can we use that? And I think it was MGC Blue. He was like, yeah, sure, why not? Like, I don't think he had any right to say that we would use that content, but <laughs> um, he did. And so I was like, okay, great, that's good enough for me. And so then um, I took that uh, TechCrunch AOK -okay to Engadget. And Engadget was like, oh, yeah, sure, that's totally okay. And um, then um, I went to Wired, which is a Condé Nast publication. And Condé Nast is uh, particularly hard to work with. They don't want to. Um, send their content to anyone unless you're paying them for it, and I wanted it for free. So um, I, I said, okay, well, you know, we're working with a lot of the other like big tech publications in, um, in the space, you know, TechCrunch, Engadget, um, you know, many others, and uh, you know, then they kind of were like, oh, I, I didn't know you were working with them, and um, I, I kind of played um, AOL's publications off on Connie Nast, and we got a bunch of Connie Nast content out of it. Um, and so I, I think often um, you should try to work with you know, not necessarily the top player at first because they have no idea who you are. Um, they're not going to pay attention to you um, if you're really small, which is what, you know, what we were at the time. And, and so you can kind of start somewhere in the middle and then you get a few people there and then it's really just like a domino effect after that. Um, and I can say the same thing has happened um, you know, at Stripe, for example. So uh, we work with a lot of e-commerce platforms. Um, a lot of the really big e-commerce platforms uh, you know, didn't really want to talk to us. They're like, oh, we work with lots of you know, payment companies. Like, I don't see why we work with you. Um, and uh, so we got into a really good place uh, with Shopify, uh, which is a really great um, e-commerce platform out of Canada. Um, they happened to raise $100 million yesterday, so they're doing really well. Um, and uh, we did an integration with them, and then we started doing you know, a bunch of integrations with a bunch of other mid-level players. And uh, that's when um, you know, I uh, basically uh, started reaching out to the, the top players in the space at the time. Um, and you know, they were like, oh yeah, like, you know, we should work together. Like, I, I heard Shafa is doing uh, interesting things with you. And, and now I go into meetings, and people are like, oh, like I want whatever, whatever deal shop finds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think often you're working on you know, playing people off of each other um, so that you um, get to a place where uh, working with you feels uh, like you're in a really competitive space, um, even though you're still a really small company. Was Shopify your first domino in this chain? Or, I mean, because that's a big domino. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, two years ago, yeah, um, right. they, they weren't necessarily in, in that place, so. Yeah, okay. Cool. Any more hacks from the uh, gentleman down the end here? Anecdotes, more stories? Question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you do want to uh, start thinking of questions, I've got like about two more. If you want to jump in now, go for it. Guys, start thinking about questions. We've got really smart talent up here, so, so start thinking about it. But um, I've got two more, and then we'll get to it. Unless you have something specific to one of these. Well, I, I just, uh, I'm assuming that all of you operate in a highly competitive environment. And so I w wonder if you could talk about the process that you've gone through when you're approaching a potential partner. How to, you know, tricks of the trade to understand what your competitors might be pitching, and how that process of a deal changes from the initial concept to then when you understand that your target partner is having a similar dialogue with your competition. Maybe some anecdotes about how that worked favorably or lessons learned from less favorable. I'll jump on that one. We had a competitor, Tom, in the early days that was around for a while. That was like our biggest competitor. They were a competitor in the media, they were a competitor in most of our deals. It was very painful. There were two things that we decided we weren't gonna do. One, we were not gonna make the chomp suck slot. I just said, we're not doing it. We're not gonna go into a meeting, I'm not gonna pretend this, this is why they blow the slot. Um, because I felt like that would demean us. And I thought that was not, not a game we wanted to play, because they used to start getting tit for tat, feature for feature. And if you're really doing the right kind of deal, it's a relationship deal. That said, internally, we made the Why Chomp Sucks manual. <laughs> and we went through all of it. And then we played a game called FUDS, which is like fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, and how do you seed that with that partner? So you start thinking, where all the places your competitors are weak. And I would tell partners, like, they go, oh, well, how do you compare to Chomp? I said, listen, we could go through an hour of Why Chomp things, but you don't want to hear that, and I don't want to do that. But let me tell you why we're great. And I would start talking about all the different things that we, we excel at, right? And knowing that I was planting these seeds for that conversation they were going to have 
was obviously my competitor. Um, and it went pretty well most of the time. It didn't always work. We lost. We didn't get every single deal. But it meant that we didn't have to play that tit for tat game, which then you start getting into these horrible experiences where you're going back and forth, well, they can do A, B, and C. Will you do A, B, and C? Or I've heard that A, B, and C is available. And then you start playing that game. You want to win those deals based on the features that you're strong at and not trying to be someone else's game. I can't stress enough, win at your own game. If you've made a great product and your team probably has, and it's got differentiation, focus on that. And find the partners that care about that. But if your partner cares about some random feature that's important to one of your competitors, don't be them. I can tell you a mistake we made, and I'll admit this, and I saw on the video, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> we always got asked early on, well, can you give us something cool and social? Everyone's doing social. And our engineers were like, social's not going to work. But we played the game. We played. Finally, I convinced some of our engineering to go ahead and do this massive project internally. It was massive for a 32-person company to dedicate seven engineers to research and social. And lo and behold, we found it wasn't very good. It didn't help us. We wasted a lot of resources. We now have you know, our own empirical evidence that it wasn't good. And all of our competitors that were doing social have mostly stopped doing it because they found it didn't work either. But we wait, thank God we didn't try and launch a product. So focus on what you do right. As a BD guy, it's easy to start listening to your partners. They're going to say, oh, we really need this, we really need that. Think about what really is important to them and sell to those strengths. Don't get sucked into the tip for tacky. It's just a, if you're going to spin your wheels. And if, even if you win that deal, you won because of that one, one feature. And when your competitor has it, then they're going to jump ship eventually. Make sure you won the deal on your merits, not just whatever that game was you were playing. So uh, to respond to your question, um, one pretty awesome like little hack um, that has worked a lot like for me personally and I'm sure for others as well. Um, it's not it's not 100 percent clear one of those. So I'll say it with that uh, um, question. Um, so if you're like a startup that's running around Silicon Valley and trying to cut deals and trying to hire people, trying to raise funding, and there's a lot of like simultaneous activity that's happening at the same time. Um, there's one set of folks that uh, have been cited to a, a lot of what's happening in your space, and those are the VCs. Um, so as evil as it sounds, you can actually like, get a lot of useful information from, from VCs. Uh, if you have the right relationships, and if you're like, uh, tuned to like, who you're talking to, who, and who's got what like, you're sharing information with, um, just want to add that. Um, let me rip off something uh, Jake, you were talking about a little bit there. And Bob, I think you actually had this question in our, in our prep. Should, should BD drive product or should product drive BD? Kind of a classic uh, chicken the egg. <laughs> super, super, super strong here. Okay, um, I'm really pretty adamant that product should drive BD. Um, I think there are, there are some people who believe differently and there are certain exceptions to that rule. But uh, two things about that are interesting. One, like most of the reason you are here and we're in Silicon Valley is because we believe in the power of product companies. And as successful as BD has been kind of the history of things, when you think about it, great products, um, usually they can sell themselves, they can help you leverage things, uh, they have kind of an identity. Uh, I think, I mean, Apple's a good example. They do a lot of BD with folks like carriers and suppliers and things like that, but ultimately it's a product, right? I think most great companies that we encounter are that. And if you leverage product effectively, it'll be much better at BD. Um, so I think that's very, 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 very much the case. Now that's different in certain industries, right? There's certain industries that like steady state it or have a set of like logistics that make it so that BD is, is kind of the right equilibrium. But I think the reason we're all here is hopefully because we believe in like the power of technology. Uh, and one of the great things about technology is hopefully it equalizes certain things like kind of the relationship game, which is fun. So like at its very core, technology eliminates some um, it kind of levels the playing field in many ways, uh, and, and you know, especially for direct consumer, but even B2B, uh, a lot of times it's the best product wins, and it's easier to distribute than ever before. Uh, it's easier um, to work with partners than ever before. So I, I'm adamantly of the product mindset. Uh, that's part of my background. That I'm in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reason I like that question is I, uh, I, I completely agree. I, I think um, I think that in order to do BD, you have to be a product person. You you have to just be really strong in product because what you're doing is you're selling something that doesn't exist yet. And so you need to know what the product roadmap is and, and where that puck is heading. So that when you go out and do 
these deals, you're, you don't have to come back and ask your product team to build something they weren't going to build anything, right? So, you know, you're trying to go out and do the deals that help them execute on their plan. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, BD is driving products, then the company is probably not going to work out very well. And, you know, I mean, I think my answer to when should you hire a BD person at the startup, I would say, you're hiring a BD person to record your Series B, there's probably some fundamental problem with, with your company, and, and you're trying to fix it with BD. But, you know, I, I think, that, you know, and I, you know, the other thing with APIs is, I think as BD people, we really should be trying to, in an ideal world, we should be trying to not have a job doing BD for our company. I, I think if, if our companies are really going to be successful, then they should have an API and they shouldn't need a BD person. And you know, because the BD person is, is an exception based person that you go to when the API isn't good enough and you need some kind of custom integration. But I think APIs, you know, sort of a, in a way, I think they're sort of, you know, the death of BD as a career. And, um, and, and I mean, I think there'll always be need for it as sort of glue to hold things together. And, and look, I mean, I don't want to be totally contrary and say it's a terrible career decision. I think it can really work out well. And then, you know, you can build a lot of very important relationships, and I think it can be a path to your CEO. And, um, you know, it, there's a lot of great things about it. But, it, but really, I, I do think fundamentally that APIs can really make uh, BD not that necessary in a lot of these companies. I had a great way to last night. But one of the really important, so I totally agree with that. <laughs> my, my goal is to obviate the need for my existence like, pretty quickly. <laughs> and I, I actually talk on this like, a lot. Um, you know, one thing I will say as somebody who like, is a self-loathing BD person and hopes everyone else is, um, is that uh, the reason BD is fundamental is like, again, you accomplish all these different things. Right? There's different aspects of any deal. Right? So there's, like, there's legal, like IP indemnity. When you guys start to do weird deals, you're going to have to encounter all this awful, awful crap. But like, IP indemnity is a huge deal. Copyright law, marketing laws, promotion laws on like a state by state, country by country basis. So across marketing, sales, product, and legal, there's all these different considerations. APIs right now are largely affecting the product side of things, right? And that, that's like really an important point. So there's oftentimes a case where I think BD and the contract is required because there's different time horizons for companies, right? Like a business like Dropbox, is that we might acquire free users. Um, and so if we pay you based on the number of users you drive us and the revenue that's driven in the first year, you're an FD. You're going to get nothing uh, in many, many cases, which is great. Um, but, but you do recognize that those users have value to us over the long term. So what you want to say is I'm not going to do it on just like a sign up. Like I want some kind of rate that you, know, you guys justify in your internal NPV so you can pay me. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I fundamentally agree, right? The API makes the product piece of BD. Like the moment you're going outside of your API to do a custom deal, you have to have a serious, serious amount of, like, I mean, you have to be really clear that you want to tell engineers. You're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> like, if you are hired here to do product, um, like, you should respect that that's the kind of thing. Jake looks like he has something to say. I think I disagree with you. <laughs> I'm a little younger, but I'll take it at this. I think that, it, I agree, product drives a company, vision drives a company that should kind of seep from the top and boil out. But I think there's a huge value in what media does. Ignoring the fact that everyone can access your technology via an API, they're going to need those relationships. You're going to need, let's be realistic, most of you BD guys in this audience are probably more like a Swiss Army knife than a salesman. That's why you're not doing sales, you're doing BD. It means being able to figure out how to get, get into Apple, because it's an, it's an iron castle and you've got to get in. There's going to be things here, there's walls that won't break down by this magic of your own stuff. And I think having BD guys, even early in the company, can help get you information into a very engineering heavy company, and I think a lot of you guys will probably have, if you're good companies, very engineering heavy, very product heavy, that's a good company. If you guys find yourself with a lot of business people and not enough engineers, quit. You're not going to make it. But um, I think that that ground, so that being able to get out there and talk to you and build relationships, even if it's just to have friends in the right places for when you need them, I think it's critical. Uh, that said, you know, different experience can drive different things. Let's have uh, one more question and then open it up to the audience. Uh, Christine, I think this was one of your questions in the prep. Continuing on that, that rip, what do you look for when you're building out a BD team? What makes a good BD person? What are the skills? And, yeah. Yeah. So I think we talked about this a bit um, in terms of product sense, but I think product sense is um, one of the most important things.
means um, to hire someone who has a really good sense for um, what your company is building, um, who are the customers, what those customers want, um, and how you can use partnerships to you know, better the company, either for uh, the purpose of revenue or for the purpose of driving more user growth or what have you, whatever is applicable. Um, I think in other cases, um, you also want someone who at least is somewhat technically minded, uh, at least in the case of Stripe. Um, we are an API. <coughs> um, if you cannot read the API docs and try to at least understand what we do and explain our product in layman's terms to another engineer and not look stupid, we're not going to hire you. So I think those types of things are really important to what we do. And I think in other companies, like perhaps um, you know, being technically minded is not necessarily as important uh, because the product isn't as technical at its core. Um, in terms of other things that are really important, um, I think um, some humility, some understanding of uh, you know, that you don't know everything that's going on in this company, that you don't necessarily um, know exactly what the partner is thinking at every single moment. Um, and I think we need people should also um, have some understanding of themselves in terms of like they should never be telling another engineer or a product person what to do. Um, I think um, in that sense, kind of <laughs> going along the lines of the last question, um, you know, if I can't convince a product person that this is something that we should build, then we probably should build it. Uh, and I'm not going to like tell them what to do. So I think that is, is kind of something that I look forward to. So I think these are all just general like mindset questions and you know how you think about certain situations. Um, and, and I also look for someone who's like you know fairly aggressive and wants to like hunt down partners and um, you know get them done uh, or get those deals done. Uh, but it's also someone who is afraid, not afraid to uh, say no to a deal when it's not a good thing. Um, so kind of balancing act. Yeah, very interesting. Anyone else have a uh, commentary on what you hire for at Dropbox or Dropbox or Dropbox or Dropbox or Dropbox or So I'll tell you what we hire for and why. I actually tell you about our hiring process, but it's a little weird. Our candidates all hate us, so in case you guys are interested. Um, so what we hire for, so I mean, intelligence and hard work are really important, but the two kind of more interesting things um, it's extremely important that you can understand both how users interact with the product, but also the person across the table. I think you, you brought this up earlier. I mean, there are people too. Like for some reason, a lot of times when you hear people talk about partnerships, they kind of like, it's like that's Microsoft or something. But that's just not how it works, right? Like there, there's not some, some like robot on the other side. So, um, so empathy and humility. Um, you know, even if you're the most important person in a company, I find most people who are the most important people in a company, they're the, they're the first people to tell you how amazing everyone else is and how much credit is deserved to everyone. So but that's kind of the rough thing that we look for. And our process is just like lay it out there. So the first thing we do is a phone screen where we have you go through a technical exercise, uh, which is surprising a lot of PD candidates. We tell you in advance. We actually put you through a programming exercise that I delight in administering. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, and then we do kind of a, a quick slide where the big focus there is like, will you hustle? So like, we're going to basically ask you, how do you crack an account that you don't have any relationship with? If you can't get your cold call them. I mean, that's anyways. I'll even tell you that's the answer, but why people still screw this up. Um, then we put through uh, an on-site presentation where you present both an API app you built using our APIs, uh, as well as a strategic partnership, including mock-ups of the product and how it worked and why. Uh, and then we put you through about eight hours of one-on-ones. Uh, and we're pretty ecstatic about it. And the funny part is, I remember my big concern with this. I was talking to the person who was helping me with this event. And we now have three people, so it's, it's plausible. And, Five times, but <laughs> it works. And the first question I had was like, I just don't know if how do we test for hard work? And I remember the person who I was working with was like, Are you kidding me? Anyone with a full time job puts up with this process is working really hard. And sure enough, I would say about 60% of candidates churn just by virtual hearing process, which is awesome. I noticed straight uh, on the BD uh, jobs page, you have a uh, you ask applicants to create a presentation. Pitch to it, you know, this is before they even apply or before they even have an interview or anything. You're asking them to actually create a pitch and presentation. I thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's, it's true. I think in, in a lot of ways, you, you have people who apply and they're just like sending through the resume, and um, you know, like they're putting in no effort um, in terms of like applying for a company. And like, what I want to know is if someone's you know applying for a role at Stripe, is you know, what can you do for us? Uh, not like, oh, I'd really like to work at Stripe because. Um, it would bring me and give me X and Y. Like I'd like to know what you'd like to do for straight. So. Cool. Anything on Quixie? What does it take to get to get a job at Quixie? 
So until recently, we weren't allowed to post on the jobs page, because that was reserved for engineering hires. <laughs> but it's been pretty cool now posting, because you get a lot more resumes. But if you would believe it, we actually got a ton of BD resumes and things like BD, um, even without posting. I get, I get LinkedIn pounded all the time, looking for a job in BD. I can tell you, none of the people on the BD team today, aside from myself, ever did BD before. I, I found that BD people from big companies, I'm, if I'm offending someone, I apologize, don't really work all that hard. BD at a big company is kind of like a marketing sales role with no goals. It's probably the most awesome job in the world, and after I make it big, I might do that. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I can tell you the, the resumes of the people that we have. We have someone who did big corporate sales for a major OEM. We have someone who graduated from Harvard and harassed me consistently for six months straight, ending up with him like bum rushing our office. Um, we have a guy who had no interest in doing BD whatsoever, but he was working at the company and I desperately needed help and convinced someone to let me have him for a few months. We then grew into an amazing BD guy who was a product guy. So the more of that dovetail, BD guys should be product guys at their core and be desperately trying to get out of the BD work and get into product. Um, we had um, an intern who had been interning for our CEO, who then grew into a BD role. And then I'm trying to think of the other. And then we have someone who is an engineer who got tired of coding because he got a carpal tunnel. Um, <laughs> 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 well, I'm going to <laughs> You pretty much couldn't do it anymore, yeah. Um, so I think when you're looking for BD roles, we look for people who are aggressive. We don't have an awesome process like that. That sounds awful. <laughs> I wouldn't call it awesome. I, even the candidates have gotten through it and aren't happy about it. <laughs> but um, it usually starts off with some, um, there's a phone screen that happens. They should be able, a conversation should be so natural with them, it's ridiculous. If it isn't, they fail. Um, after that, they should come in for an interview. And things that really impress me is when they sell me what they're going to do for me, right? Not just about how fantastic they were. They should be humble. They should be excited. They should have researched your company before they got there. Pretty, it's pretty much an automatic fail. If you don't know what we do or you pronounce our company quickly, pretty much that's it. And then um, <laughs> after they've gotten through that, they think that we do make them do a presentation. We just don't give them the warning in advance. Um, we send them a half finished deck that I started early on in the company. It's been around for a long time. Say, hey, can you finish this up and then present it to us? It gives me a couple of good insights. A, we see what their presentation skill looks like. I'm a huge stickler for PowerPoints. They should look perfect and awesome. They just have to. I can tell you, we once got complicated, complimented by a major OEM because we came in with this deck and we presented it and the guy was like, that is so much better than our marketing department produces. And I think it's critical that leaves an impression of how professional you are, even if you're five people. That PowerPoint should be perfect. And then we judge them on their presentation. Now we acknowledge that they may not get the product exactly perfect, but they should be able to figure it out on their own and be able to present something meaningful. Um, People get through the process sometimes, and then it's a function of you know, how much money you have in the budget. I've noticed that most BD guys that apply are looking for ridiculously high salaries, and we're like, well, you know, it sounds like you should get a job at Microsoft or something. Um, at a startup, just be realistic. The top paid people at a startup are the engineers and the product people. They're not the BD guys. You're in, you should be getting some share, hopefully, but um, you're there to sweat tears. If you, if you really, really want to make big bucks early out in your career, go get an engineering degree and go start coding. Um, but great BD guys prove their worth, earn their stripes, and then eventually will move up the ranks of the company and be able to really influence stuff. Um, you've got to prove it. You've got to put the money where your mouth is every time, every day when you come to that office. No matter what goes wrong, whether engineering doesn't deliver or does deliver, it's your job to be the, we, we joke we're the shotgun and the sniper rifle for the product team. It's gone. We don't get to aim, we better hit the target. Awesome. Let's do a couple audience questions uh, for the next 15 minutes and we'll wrap it up. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you go ahead. Okay, so uh, I kind of bucket biz dev and sales, sort of the same sales function, but I've heard a couple of times you guys have drawn a line and said, you thought you said that you know, I enjoy the sales, and you made that distinction, so I'm just curious so how do you really want to compare those? How are they distinct? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I mean, someone said like BD is sales without a quota, and I think the you know there, there's there's truth to that because I, I think with BD you really have to reinvent your job every every three months or so, and um, you know I, I think that's what's great about it for some people that don't really want that you know okay here's my product that I need to go sell and these are the people I sell it to and it's sort of you know 
it's maybe a little too rigid. But, but I will say this, I think that a, a lot of people come to me and ask me, you know, should I do BD, how, how do I figure out how to do BD? And, and a lot of times I say, first thing is figure out, do you really want to do BD? Because, you know, and I go through what, like I said before, how sales is, it, it's so beautiful in its simplicity, where you just know what success looks like. The, the fundamental problem with BD is you go out and you get this deal, like when I was at AOL, I, you know, I got this deal with Verizon. I thought it was going to be like the best thing for AOL. I, I just, it's like the biggest carrier in the U.S. I just thought this is going to, you know, be a home run. And you know, a year and a half, I wasn't even there when the deal got closed. You know, and, and it was so hard to convince my own company to do this deal for the value of the deal. And I, and I think that's the sort of the sort of complexity of, of BD is that you're convincing two parties. Right? And your own company is the hardest party to convince to do the deal. And in sales, you're, you've got a customer that you need to convince, and your own company is 100% behind you that selling that thing is going to be a success. Um, I just got to ask that. Uh, to totally agree with what you just said. Um, I, like, I generally think of BD as, um, not to like, that announce any sales folks in the audience, but I think of BD as like, more creative version of sales, where you're not selling a turnkey product and there's a, you know, a, a transaction that's been figured out. Um, you can pass out of the box and like pick up new kinds of partnerships and um, like new, totally new kinds of deals. Yes, a uh, question for Christina and Dan. Um, it sort of follows the API discussion. So uh, uh, earlier this year, I uh, rewrite wrote a company about API, it's like uh, a computer without the internet, right? And what I'm curious about is like, when you look out in the API landscape, there's a lot of companies who have an API, public API, but then they pull back and they make the API available to their partners. So honest answer, well, what's your honest answer? How much true value to the company is driven through the deals that you live Doing with partners that use API versus what you get through the the, uh, the public API side. Maybe give a quick recap of the question. Sure. Um, okay, so there's a couple facets, so I'm gonna try. Um, <laughs> that's the worst. Answering questions is easy, repeating questions is hard. Um, so the question was: a lot of companies have basically. I'm gonna paraphrase, but just not a super shaker head at all. Um, so a lot of companies have an API or say an API is really important, but then over time they kind of pull their API back, they make it private, they kind of close it off in different ways, and it affects their partners. Um, so how, how do you determine how valuable an API really is uh, to a company and, and kind of how do you... Well, I'm not saying it affects your partner, I'm saying you end up focusing, companies end up focusing all their energy on the partner because that's where the true value is, and then they end up ditching the public nature of it. So Netflix being a really good example. <laughs> So we have very different APIs. We have similar APIs and different APIs. Stripe has two different products. They have a fit just do a much better job than I can of explaining this. But they have, have their fundamental API, which is a set of developers, and they have something called Stripe Connect, which allows the developer to authenticate so that other people can use the API on their behalf. Um, so, so they're a little different, so I'm probably curious um, for her answer. But so the Dropbox API, um, there's kind of an, a magnificent scale achieved by Dropbox. Uh, and the API is a huge, huge aspect of that that I you know existed before my time in many ways, but so we have over 100,000 active partners, and we're really mean about what it means to be an active partner using our API, really mean. Um, and our goal as a company is that every time you as a person, uh, not a user, not like a customer, you as a person interacts with your data, we should make that experience better. Right? And that's, that's the blanket goal of the company. Um, and it's really important to align the incentives of your company with your API. So I think. You know, and I, I don't want to speak totally out of target, but having talked to people at Twitter, which is kind of one of the more famous examples of an API changing course, I think Twitter was still figuring out what it meant, like what was the company mission around, like how do we generate revenue? Um, and you know, at, at various points in time, that was changing and differing, and, and their API got to become a casualty of that. You know, I won't go into specifics, but in a lot of ways that happened. Um, for us to achieve that goal, we either have to build all the applications ourselves or work with third parties. That, that, that's it. That's the only way we can do it. In some cases, we are building the application ourselves. Right? I think Dropbox is a core service. It's kind of like 
the technical out there is basically the file system. We don't like to use that word because it's not super, uh, it's super friendly, but it's a file system. And um, we want to make sure everyone can use it all the time, but one thing that comes up is, well, what if I'm a business user and my IT guy has concerns? And so when you think about Dropbox for business, I mean, there's two things to it. One, we want to have the best experience for business customers, but two, we don't want business customers to be prevented from kind of using Dropbox. We think that's an unnatural contortion of kind of just reality. You're not two different people. You're two personas, you're one person, right? Uh, and that's just how we believe it. So either we're gonna have to build the entire service area of all the apps out there to interact with data, um, or uh, we're gonna have to work with third parties. And that's really important to us. Uh, and we kind of recognize as a company that's unrealistic given that our one app today is, you know, in a lot of ways, File Explorer, it's a file viewer in some cases, you can share files and share folders, but um, we're kind of fundamentally the API company from our start. One way of thinking about this is, I mean, so how many people use Dropbox, by the way? It's kind of fun. Okay, how many people have ever created a file with Dropbox? How? So you actually can't create a file with Dropbox. <laughs> Yeah, so like Dropbox, there is no such thing as a Dropbox file. We can't oh, edit one. You can actually, on mobile, we have like a lightweight text editor. Yeah. Um, um, for those people who are yeah, bringing that one up, so there's like a slight case. But I can assure you the existence of our business is predicated on that lightweight kind of mobile text editor that I think somebody forgot exists. By the way, at Dropbox, I think people are like, oh, it's there. They're like, oh, no. Um, so, well, what, what are people doing with it? Right? What are the most popular files in the world? So, Microsoft Office, right? And Microsoft Office is just a behemoth in the world. Uh, photos. The photos you take, uh, Adobe file types, audio, music, video, um, programming, code, text, etc. And so we already work with all those guys. We just do it really seamlessly. Like you don't know that you know. If you were a web designer, you thought about how would I. So I'm going on, so I apologize. But if you were a web designer, and you were just like thinking, how would I design the experience where a user saves a file? Um, there's no way in hell you would come up with how people do it in Dropbox. Which is there's two options for Dropbox users. One is I drag and drop a file from one place to another. That's a ridiculous concept. Like that is just ludicrous. You'd be like, every single user is going to use that. So what they're going to do is like, well, I don't really recognize that much value for that. I'm just going to drag this file over. Or two, you change your save as location. And for everyone who's done kind of consumer, like large scale mass consumer plays, these are ridiculous changes in the game. Right? Um, they had about 200 million people have done it. Uh, and so we work seamlessly with Microsoft Word. Microsoft doesn't know about it. <laughs> like, I mean, they know. They don't really care. We don't affect them in any way. We kind of obey their changes however they work best. Um, and we don't have to worry about it. It just kind of works seamlessly with the user. And that's just the core of the company. Um, and that's awesome. Like that's, we're very lucky. I think other companies have their own wheels. Like Twitter and Facebook, like the services are Twitter and Facebook. Right? That's the service that you're getting access to. It's, it's like their own thing. And they have things like photos in them. But even those photos, like in the terms of service, will spell this out in different ways. But those aren't necessarily, there's like some questionable way, ways around describing whose photos those are when they go to Facebook. And I think it's a great product. I was an investor at Excel Partners before, so I'm a huge Facebook fan. Um, but the Dropbox, it's your data. We're just kind of helping you make it more useful. Um, and that's really awesome. Uh, and it's why I love the job I do. Uh, and I think it's pretty unique in a lot of things. Sorry, that was a long answer. Christine, <laughs> <laughs> one more quick question. Right <laughs> oh, uh, just like, as a quick answer, uh, so uh, Stripe, I mean, it, is an API, so we're an API or core. It's not like we started as a social networking company and then later you know, launched an, an API or something like that. Um, so uh, if we got rid of the API, you know, we would not exist. So uh, that's you know one reason why we have the API. Um, and, and in terms of um, other things that we do, um, as Dan mentioned, we have this uh, authentication flow on top of our API uh, that other platforms can use so that they can retrieve access um, for other users' data. And they can also um, you know, make charges on behalf of other users, etc. And this is, uh, you know, a core strategy for our overall growth um, in the long term. And I think looking at that product specifically, um, you know, we're not a, a lot of those applications that are built on top of Stripe Connect, which is that product, um, are applications that we would never build. So invoicing, accounting applications, um, you know, financing applications where you can like offer someone a loan based on the Stripe data. That they you know, we're not going to build these companies, you know, it's, our mission is not to be the next QuickBooks or what have you. So we want to make sure that we are something that really infiltrates um, every other aspect of a business's life cycle. So you start out on Stripe, uh, now you need accounting tools, then you need data analytics tools, then you need, you know, X and Y, and so you can connect your Stripe account to all of these different applications. 
and that makes Stripe as a whole much more powerful as a product and as a platform. So that's kind of how we see it, as more of like a stickiness factor and then also for the growth factor. I think if you're looking at other applications um, and other services out there, um, like to give you an example, like Pinterest, I think two years ago said they were going to come back with an API. Um, and you know, I, and I think they, they decided like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this because like, look at how everybody else has put out uh, their APIs and then you know, they've like, scaled it back. Um, so if you grow too big on, on Facebook, then Facebook starts to worry about you and starts to pull your access to things. You know? um, and so you can have a lot of problems as a platform when you don't necessarily want the application <coughs> built on top of the platform. Interesting. All right, uh, one more. Short, short answer, question is Yeah. Okay, go for it. So since the startup BD event, like broadly, what are like some of the genuine way as a BD that if you are like a no-name startup, how do you get attention from the big players? You know, not hacks, not like fake it until you made it. Like there's gotta be some genuine way to make it care about. Traction. <laughs> okay, fine. Yes. Right. Um, so related to traction, um, yes, you have some kind of like value to bring to the table. There has to be a reason why like some big company would want to do a deal for you. Like, you have to make their life easier, you have to help them make money, or whatever that is. And then you have to know how to like articulate it from the <coughs> yeah. I, I just feel like there's a certain you know, we forget sometimes but we're in Silicon Valley and there's sort of like this mystique to Silicon Valley and the rest of the country. And you, you know, it's like you can get a lot of mileage whether if you're the BD guy, say, you know, you, you know, it, you can still drop the names of your investors in, in an email, and you know it's like try to make your company sound a little bit like the company that they saw on that reality show. About, you know what I mean? It's like you are the hot Silicon Valley startup. They don't know that you're not, and and so it's like even if you're the BD guy, you're like, no, my C, my CEO and I were sitting down. We were looking at companies, and you are the perfect company for us to work with. I mean, it, this is like terrible. Word, but it's like you, you want to let them know that that you specific, this is not a form email like you like you're reaching out to them and maybe like two other people and you guys are a hot startup and you know you're you're backed by these people that, that they probably want to meet right because they probably want to start their own company and move out to the Silicon Valley and you know meet Mark Zuckerberg right and they're stuck at some desk job at Verizon and, and so it's like you know, play that hand a little bit and be like, you know, I'm the entrepreneurial hot show. Yeah. All right, any, any last minute hacks or uh, a quick one on that one? Press. It's not hard in the valley to get press. There are tons of blogs and places you can get press. And if you're doing something interesting, when you're early, like TechCrunch will report on your launch guarantee. Let them know. Giga will then report on it right after. You know, you can, <laughs> you can, go, you can go get separate articles and then you can reference those, put them in your slides, it adds validation. I, I think it's TechCrunch gets reposted in New York Times. Like, and you can be like, oh, we have a New York Times article. You know, it, it's a little bit happy. You can get real press, and if you have something, a really cool story, you'll get picked up. Reporters are looking for stories because that's their job. So when you call them to report about you, you're helping them get their job done. Just like a sales guy wants to get your money, reporters want to get their story. So that's the easy way to get things. I think that, and that whole join, join me on my awesome startup ride, they want that. They want to hear how you work in a closet. Like, it gets them excited. You have a question that can be answered in one yeah. minute or less? Yeah. Okay, go so, for it. So how do you put together a quick and easy sort of strong end evaluation of a, of a early partnership? Turn 
um, can this be a win-win? Can I go to that partner and say, oh, you know, it seems like you're having a lot of trouble with like X, Y, Z product. Well, you know, we can increase your conversion rates by like X or Y, um, as we've seen with other platforms, um, if you integrate our product. Or something. How do you validate the thesis? I mean, do the hard thing, right? I, I guess what, what, this will lead into the next question, which is like a parting thought. So there, there are two things that I think are I think, three things. So the first is like, we've talked a lot about like hacks or, or, or BS or fluff or whatever, but probably the most important thing by far is actually, is actually being genuine and reasonable. It turns out like it's much easier to work with other people when they A, trust you, which is the most important thing you have by far, and B, you align incentives, right? And usually there's something you can offer that they want. So your question is like, how do you think about any partnership, right? Um, so be honest with yourself, do the hard part, which is to say, you know, we sit down and it sucks because some partnerships are like, we're gonna get a number of users, but we actually put down what we think the net present value of each user will be in their costs over time. And if we write down any assumptions that we think, like somebody in the room is gonna be like, stop being an asshole, then you feel pretty bad about it. You're like, this is probably a bad idea. Um, and I think if anything, we're more conservative than we should be with those partners, right? Um, and it's reasonable. And if you're really the guy who wants to stand in the room and say, I don't care what this model says, we should still do it. That's tolerable, right? We're a startup, and you know, the Dropbox business model in general is something that always seems kind of a little bit insane. But then you got to be the person who's going to pound the table and say, "I'm going to get this done." It's my ass on the line. But do the hard work. Like I think there's nothing worse than somebody who wants to do a deal, and you say, "Like, okay, put together like three pages on this deal that's going to cost us like hundred million bucks." And they're like, uh, "I don't want to write an email. Like, I don't want to go through the hard work. I can't learn how to use Excel." Um, <laughs> just, I mean, like, it's just really not that hard. I, I think. And then the, the final point like, on B like, that I think is really interesting is like, most people suck at B. Like, I can't stress this enough. Like, 99% of people who do B are terrible. The reason I do B now is because after being an engineer and VC, and I thought to myself, like, wow, what's the most arbitrageable opportunity out there in self value? I was like, shit, meeting people are fucking terrible. Like, I'm going to do this. And it's true. I mean, when you look around like that, if you, I will work there, if you work harder, if you work smarter, if you try harder, there's a lot there. Right? There's a lot there to be done. And people respect it. Like when you want to work across the table from somebody, you want to work with somebody who's smart, works hard, who's going to be responsive. That's all really, really important. And like the hiring process that sucks and is awful, it is. But you know what's really nice? When you get to the other side, you look around and you're like, holy shit, you went through this hiring process too. Like I can trust you to get something done. Uh, and I think that's really, really outstandingly important. Um, so anything you do, like just work harder, do the hard work. If you ever think to yourself like, oh, it'll take me ten extra hours this week to like figure out the MVP model, like. Fuck it. Like it's 10 extra hours, it's probably worth it. The deal's not worth it 10 extra hours. You got other things you should do. Alright guys, any parting thoughts that just have to be said? Or are we good to go here? Alright, can we have a, a good round of applause?